Hey, greetings everybody. Gleekon here again with another episode of War of Warcraft. We're going to do chapter 12 of the Demon Soul today. Um, after this, we're going to be halfway through the book and halfway through the trilogy. So we're just progressing along nicely. Um, all right. Come around my fire. Stay a while and listen to chapter 12. Illidan should have been going over strategy with the Moon Guard, but at that moment he couldn't have cared less about the war. All he could think about was that he had made an abysmal fool out of himself in front of Tyrande. He had bared his soul to her, only to discover that his brother had already staked his territory. Tyrande had chosen Malthurion. Even right then he's so like deluded he didn't bury his soul. He didn't really say anything she didn't know already. The worst of it was, his twin was probably too caught up in his craft to notice. Lord Ravencrest's personal sorcerer stalked past a picket. The guard stationed there raised his weapon and in a slightly anxious voice declared, All, all us to stay within the bounds of the camp, Master Illidan, by order of... I know whose order it is, but... Illidan's amber eyes stirred deep. The soldier swallowed and stepped aside. The area beyond was still slightly wooded the Burning Legion having lost the opportunity during their brief hold to destroy everything. While many took heart from this fact, Illidan would not have cared if the entire area had been scorched. He raised one hand slightly and even considered starting the conflagration himself, then dropped the idea. I wonder if he gets captured. And Archimond convinces him, and that's how he does his change. Even though Malfurion had run afoul of demons in the lands south, his brother had no fear of doing likewise here. In the first place, Illidan walked only a short distance from the camp, stepping barely out of sight. In the second place, any demon who tried to attack him now would have been reduced to ash in the blink of an eye. Illidan's inner rage was such that he dreamed of fighting something, anything, in order to drain himself of the jealousy he now felt against Malfurion. But no fell beast sought to drain him dry. No infernal attempted to barrel him older over... No Eridar, no Doom Guard, not even one of the laughable Fell Guard. The whole of the Burning Legion feared to face Illidan alone, for they knew he was an unbeatable force. Save where it concerned the love of one person. Finding a huge rock upon which to sit, Illidan thought over all his wonderful plans. Lord Ravencrest's adoption of him as one of his most trusted servants had been a coup. It had enabled the twin to at last seriously consider what had been formulating in his mind for the previous three seasons. He had long looked past Tyrande as a child and saw her as the beauteous female that she was. While Malfurion had talked to birds, he had planned on how to ask Tyrande to be his mate. In his head, everything had fallen into place perfectly. One could not but help admire his position, and he knew that many other females had indicated their desire for him. Over a short period of time, Illidan had gained control of those Moonguard left alive and his hand had saved many night elves from destruction. He was powerful, handsome, and a hero. Tyrande should have fallen over herself to be his, and she would have, if not for Malfurion. With a snarl, the sorcerer gestured at another rock nearby. It transformed instantly into a recreation of his brother's face, so much his own, and yet not. Illidan clenched his fist. The face shattered, fragments crumbling into a loose pile. She should have been mine. His words echoed through the woods. Malfurion's siblings snarled at his own voice, each repetition reminding him how much he'd lost. She would have been mine, he corrected himself, lost in pity. If not for you, brother Malfurion, she would have been mine. He is always taking precedence, came a sudden thought into his head, when clearly it should have should be you. Me? Because I have these eyes, Illidan laughed at himself. My miraculous amber eyes. A sign of greatness. An omen of legend. A jest played upon me by the gods, the sorcerer rose, heading deeper into the woods. Even on the move, however, he could not escape the voice, the thoughts, and some part of him did not truly wish to. Malfurion does not even know she wants him. He would never know. 
What am I supposed to do? Keep them apart? I might as well try to keep the moon from rising. But if not, Lyrian would perish in the war before he could ever know the truth. It would be as if her choice never happened. She would surely The sorcerer paused. He cupped his hands, and in the poems, he created an image of Tyrande dancing. She was slightly younger and wearing a flowing skirt. The image was her as Illidan recalled from a festival a few seasons back. That had been the first time he had considered her more than a play friend. If there was no more Malfuria. See, I'm not sure here. Is this the same voice corrupting Deathwing? Maybe. Is it... Sargeras, Archimond, the old gods, his own inner voice. It's hard to say, so I don't know exactly how to play it yet. Illidan suddenly clapped his hand shut, dissipating the vision. No! That'd be barbaric! And yet Illidan paused immediately after, perversely fascinated by the thought. Turn him over to them? I battles become confused. Some are left behind. No one is ever to blame. No one is ever to blame, murmured Illidan. He opened his hands and once again Tyrande's image danced for him. He watched it for a time, considering. I'm actually surprised this hasn't happened before now where he's like, screw him, I'll leave you for yourself. But once more the sorcerer clapped his palms tight. Then, as if sickened by his dark thoughts, he brushed his hands against his garments and quickly headed back to camp. Never, he growled under his breath. Not my brother, never. The sorcerer continued muttering to himself as he walked. He therefore did not notice when the figure separated itself from the trees, watching him from a distance and chuckling at the night elf's momentary lapse of honor and brotherhood. The groundwork is laid, he whispered in amusement. that it snuck off in the opposite direction, moving along two furred limbs ending in hooves. Oh, well, Xavius. See, I didn't even mention him. Should have known he's like a manipulator. Unwilling to wait any longer for the druid and the mage to return, Lord Ravencrest ordered the night elves to move out the next day. It was clear that most of his followers would have preferred to march at night, but the noble would not let the demons see him as too predictable. His fighters were gradually becoming as accustomed to the sun as much as they could, even though it meant that their strength was not at its peak. Ravencrest now relied on the determination of his people, their understanding that if they failed, this would be their end. The Burning Legion, in turn, awaited them not at all that far away. The night elves marched, knowing that bloodshed lurked just beyond the horizon, but they marched nonetheless. And so, once more, the struggle for Kalimdor went on. While the Night Elves battled to survive and Illidan sought to come to grips with his foul thoughts, Krasis struggled with an entirely different matter, one that Malfurion suspected he had not planned, planned for. It goes on for as far as I can detect, the mage hissed in frust frustration. It was invisible to the eye, but not to the touch. It was a vast unseen shield that held them but a day, by Krasis's measurement, from their goal. They had discovered it the hard way. Krasis's hippogriff had collided with nothing, the crash so violent that the mage had been thrown from the injured animal's back. Malfurion, aware that his own hippogriff could never reach Krasis in time, sought out the aid of the wind. A powerful mountain blast threw his companion up again, close enough for the druid to grasp the mage's arm. They had then landed to study this new obstacle. And after several hours of study, Krasis appeared no closer to the answer. The sight of him looking so baffled unnerved the druid more than he had let on. At last, Krasis uttered the unthinkable. I am defeated. You find no method by which to pierce it. Worse, druid, 
I cannot even contact anyone within. Even my thoughts are barred. Alfurion had come to deeply respect Krasis. The mysterious mage had helped save him when Lord Xavius had captured his spirit. Krasis had also been instrumental in enabling the Night Elf to vanquish the Queen's advisor and destroy the first portal to see him thus. So close, continued the mage. So very close. This is his work, to be sure. Whose work? His eyes narrowing, Krasis looked just enough like a pale night elf to make his expression that much more unsettling. He appeared to be measuring his companion, and Malfurion suddenly found himself hoping to be found worthy. Yes, you should know. You deserve to know. The druid held his breath. Whatever Krasis desired to reveal, it surely had to be of monumental importance. Look directly into my eyes, Malfurion. When the night elf had obeyed, Krasis said, There are three of us that you and yours term outsiders. There is Ronin, who calls himself a human. And there is Brox, the orc. You know not their races, but they are as you see them. A human and an orc. The elder figure paused. Thinking he had to respond, Malfurion nodded. A human and an orc. Have I ever said what it is I am? Have either of the others specified? Thinking back, the Night Elf could not recall anyone giving name to Krasis' race. You are of, el of Night Elven blood. You look enough like us to be kin. If I might look like one of your kind if you were dead a year or more. But that is as close a resemblance as we can admit, yes. What you see is only a guise. There are no blood ties between your race and mine, nor, for that matter, mine with humans, orcs, dwarves, or Torin. Malfurion looked confused. Then what are you? Krasis's gaze drew him in further. All he could see were those alien eyes. Look deep, druid. Look deep and think of what you know of me. As he stared into his companion's eyes, Malfurion recalled everything he knew, which was not much at all. A spellcaster of remarkable knowledge and talent, even at his most ill, Krasis had carried about him an aura of incredible age and ability. The sisterhood had sensed it, although none of them seemed to understand exactly what it meant, as did the Moon Guard. Even the Night Savers treated him better than they did the masters who had raised them. And for a time, the mage had even commanded the friendship of a dragon. A dragon. Without the behemoth near, Krasis had suffered as if on his deathbed. The dragon, too, had shown signs of weariness beyond the ordinary. Together, however, they had been as one, their strength magnified. But there had been more to it than that. Coilstraws had spoken with Krasis like none other, as an equal, almost a brother. Seeing the growing realization on the druid's face, Krasis whispered, You are at the threshold of understanding. Cross it now. He opened himself up for Malfurion to see. In the Night Elf's mind, Krasis transformed, his robes ripped to shreds as his body grew and twisted. His legs bent in reverse and his feet and hands became long, clawed appendages. Wings sprouted from his back, expanding until they were great enough to blot out the moon. Krasis' face stretched. His nose and mouth became one growing into a savage maw. His hair solidified, turning into a scaled crest that ran down the length of his back all the way to the tip of the tail that had formed at the same time as the wings. And as crimson scales covered every inch of the other's body, Malfurion blurted the name by which all knew such huge fearsome leviathans. Dragon! And as quickly as the incredible mage had appeared before him, it now vanished. Malfurion shook his head and eyed the figure before him. Yes, Malfurion Storm Rage, I am a dragon. A red dragon, to be precise. Long have I worn the form of one mortal creature or another. However, for it has been my choice to walk among you, teaching and learning as I strive for peace among all of us. A dragon. Malfurion shook his head, explained so much in retrospect, and raised many more questions in turn. Among those in the host, only Ronin fully knows who and what I am, although the orc may understand, and the sisterhood likely has its suspicions. Are humans allied to dragons? Nay, but in my guise, as you see me, Ronan was my student, an exceptional mage even for one of his versatile race. I trust him in some ways more than I do many of my own people. As if to emphasize that fact, Krasis, Malfurion could not yet accept terming him a dragon, slapped one hand against the invisible barrier, and this only adds credence to why that is so. 
This should not be here. A dragon? But why didn't you transform in order to fly here? Why have me summoned the hippogriffs? More curious incidents occurred to the night elf. You could have been slain more than once, including when last we fought the demons. Some things must remain hidden, Malfurion, but I tell you this much. I do not transform because I cannot. That ability has been stripped from me for the time being. Ah. Uh, I see. Crisis turned his gaze back to the concealed wall again, seeking some entrance through it. You perceive why I felt so certain that I would be able to confront the dragons. They will listen to one of their own. They will also tell one of their own why they are acting so mysteriously. He hissed savagely, startling the night elf. If I can contact them first, who would do this? It almost appeared that Crasus intended to answer, but then he clamped his mouth tight. After several seconds of obvious inner turmoil, he glumly responded, It does not matter. What does is that I have failed. The one hope I had for ensuring the outcome of the war is beyond my reach. There was much that the dragon mage had not told Malfurion, and the, the night elf knew it. However, the druid also respected Krasis enough not to pursue the matter any further. All Malfurion wanted to do now was help, especially with his new understanding of the situation. If Krasis could convince his kind to join with the defenders, then surely that would spell a quick end to the Burning Legion. But their spells could not open the wall, and neither of the two could simply walk through it like a ghost, or, swallowing hard, the druid said, I may know a way through, at least for me. What do you mean? Ah, uh, I could walk the Emerald Dream. Mage's visage darkened, then grew thoughtful. Malfurion wanted him to reject the idea out of hand, but instead Krasis nodded. Yes. Yes, that may be the one way. But will it help? I don't even know whether or not they'll be able to hear or see me, and if they do, will they listen? One may be able to do all. You must seek her specifically. Her name is Isera. Isera. Cenarius had spoken her name when offering to teach a student how to walk the Dream Realm. Isera was one of the five great aspects. She ruled the Emerald Dream. Certainly Isera would be able to both hear and see the druid's spirit form, but would she bother listening to his words? Reading the Night Elf's obvious reluctance, Krasis added, If you can convince her to bring you to the attention of Alexstrasza, the Red Dragon, then perhaps she in turn can question Coilstraz, who knows us both. Alexstrasza will listen to him. From the way the inflection of his voice changed whenever he spoke the other name, Malfurion understood that this other dragon was very, very important to Krasis on a personal level. He knew of Alexstrasza as another of the aspects, and wondered how Krasis could speak of her so easily. His companion was more than simply a dragon who spied on the younger races. He held some status among even his own kind. The knowledge strengthened Malfurion. I'll do what I can. Should Ysera show reluctance, Krasis further advised. It would be good to mention Cenarius to her, more than once if necessary. Not certain why that should make a difference, but trusting to Krasis's wisdom, the Night Elf nodded and sat down right where he was. Krasis watched him in silence as he positioned his body. Satisfied with the arrangement, Malfurion shut his eyes and focused. At first he meditated, calming his body. As he relaxed, the Night Elf felt the first hints of slumber touch him. He welcomed them, encouraged them. More and more, the mortal world retreated from the Druid, Peace draped over Malfurion like a blanket. He knew that Krasis watched over him, so there was no fear of letting go. The mage would protect his defenseless form, and before he knew it, Malfurion slept. Yet at the same time, he felt more awake than ever. The night elf concentrated now on departing from the mortal plane. He did as Cenarius had bid him, working to separate his spirit from his body. It proved so simple to do both and locate the way into the Emerald Dream that Malfurion felt ashamed about his earlier hesitation. So long as he remained fixed on his quest, surely it would be safe to, tra to traverse the other realm. A hint of green immediately shaded everything. Krasis faded away as Malfurion's surroundings changed. The mountainous region looked surprisingly similar in both dimensions, but the peaks in the Emerald Dream were sharper, less weathered. Here was how they appeared when the creators had first raised them up from the primal soil. Despite the urgency of his mission, Malfurion paused to admire the Celestial's handiwork. The sheer majesty of all he saw astounded him. But nothing would remain in the true world if the Burning Legion was not stopped, and so the druid finally moved on. He reached out to the barrier, expecting resistance, yet nothing slowed his hand. Sure enough, in the Emerald Dream, the spell did not exist. The dragons expected any intruders to be of the more earthly kind, and therefore subject to the world's natural laws. Drifting on past where the wall had been, Malfurion headed toward the tallest peaks in the distance. 
Prior to his collision with the barrier, Crasis had indicated them as where his kind could be found. Since the elder mage had nothing con said nothing contrary before the druid had acted, Malfurion took it for granted that he should continue on in that direction. He flew over the silent land, the huge mountains making him feel most insignificant. The green hue coloring everything, coupled with the lack of any animal life, added to the surreal feel of his surroundings. As he neared what he believed his destination, Malfurion concentrated. The green coloring faded somewhat, and he began to notice details of weathering. The druid spirit still walked the Emerald Dream, but he now saw into the present-day world as well. And his first view was that of the overwhelming, ferocious countenance of a crimson dragon. Startled, Malfurion pulled back. He expected the behemoth's head to dart forward and snap him up, but the sentinel continued to stare through him. It took the druid a few seconds to realize that the dragon could not see him. The presence of the guardian, who perched atop a high-pointed peak, verified that the night elf had to be near where the dragons gathered. However, Malfurion did not feel he had the time to go searching one mountain after another for their location. Instead, he thought of what he knew. Ysera was mistress of the Emerald Dream. This near to her, surely she would hear his mental summons. Whether Ysera would answer, however, was another question. Knowing he could only try, the druid faded back into the Emerald Dream and imagined the green dragon. He knew that his perception of her was far from fact, but it gave his thoughts something upon which to concentrate. Ysera. Mistress of the dreamland, great aspect, I humbly seek communion with you. I bring the word of one who knows she who is life, your sister, Alexstrasza. Malfurion waited. When it became clear that he would not be receiving an answer, he tried again. Ysera, she of the dreaming, in the name of Cenarius, lord of the wood, I ask this boon of you. I call upon you too. He broke off as he sensed the sudden presence of another. The druid twisted his head to the right and beheld the thin female of his race, clad in a translucent robe that fluttered even though there was no wind. The hood of the robe covered all but her face, and a beautiful yet calm face whose only offsetting feature was the eyes, or rather the closed lids that covered them. The figure might have looked like a night elf, but in addition to the bright emerald hair she had, more arresting than the green of any true night elf, her skin, garments, all, were tinted one shade or another of the same color. There could be no doubt that this was Isera. I have come, she responded, quiet but firm, her eyes never opening, if only to put an end to your shouting. Your thoughts reverberated through my mind, like an unceasing drumbeat. Malfurion sought to kneel, my lady. She waved a slim hand. I need not be flattered by such gestures. You have called. I have come. Have your say, and be gone. His success still amazed the night elf. Here in this other form stood one of the great aspects. That she had deigned to respond, he could scarcely believe. Forgive me, I would never seek to disturb you. And yet here you are. I've come with one who knows of you well. A dragon called Crasis. His name is known, even if his mind is suspect. What of him? He seeks an audience with Alexstrasza. He can't break through the barrier that surrounds this place. As he spoke, Malfurion had to focus hard on the aspect. Ysera constantly shimmered in and out, almost as if she were a figment of his imagination. Her expression did not change, save that beneath the eyelids there was constant movement. That she saw, Malfurion did not doubt, but how she did made him most curious. Barrier has been set because the planning we do is of the most delicate nature, spoke the aspect. No word of what we do must be revealed until the time is ripe. So says the earth warder. But he must enter. And he will not. I have no say over the matter. Is that all? Malfurion mulled over Crasis's words. Then if he can speak to Alexstrasza through you? Ysera laughed. Such a startling shift that the night elf stood as stricken. You are audacious, mortal creature. I am to be your conduit, as he interrupts my sister during a most pressing time. Is there anything else you would like while you are asking? By my Shondo Cenarius, this is all I seek and I wouldn't do it if it wasn't necessary. A peculiar thing happened when he mentioned the demigod by name. 
If Sarah's image grew especially hazy and the eyes beneath her lids seemed to look down, the reaction, although very brief, was so very noticeable. I see no reason to continue this irritation. Return to your companion, Night Elf, and please, Mistress of the Emerald Dream, Cenarius will vouch for me. He, there is no reason to bring him up, she suddenly snapped. For just the briefest of moments, he saw her almost looked ready to open her eyes. Her expression had become one that Malfurion recognized all too well from his childhood. Earlier he had thought that Cenarius and Ysera had been lovers, but that was not the case, for what he could read in her expression. Ysera, she of the dreaming, one of the five great aspects, had reacted to the demigod's name as might a loving mother. I don't think I knew that. Somewhat ashamed, the druid retreated from her. Ysera, clearly caught up in some memory, paid him no mind. For the first time since he had met Crasus, Malfurion was angry with him. This was ill knowledge, and his companion should have known that. He started to depart the dream realm, but Isera turned her sightless gaze toward him and suddenly announced, I will be the bridge you need to reach, Shalikstraza. My lady, we will speak no more about this situation, Night Elf, or I will cast you out of my domain forever. Shutting his mouth tight, Malfuri and acquiesced. Whatever her relationship with the forest lord, it had been very, very deep and long in term. I will guide your spirit to where we now meet, and you will wait until I indicate that your time to converse with my sister has come. Then and only then will I transmit your words to her, your words and his. The ascetic tone by which she said the last word spoke of her fury toward Crasis. Praying that his companion's rash suggestion would not get them both killed, the druid voicelessly agreed. She stretched forth her hand. Take it. With the utmost respect, Malfurion obeyed. He had never touched another spirit in the Emerald Dream and had no idea what to expect. To his surprise, though, Ysera's hand felt like a mortal one and had no ethereal quality. He might have been holding his mother's hand. Remember my warning, the aspect said. Before he could respond, they entered the mortal plane. The transition was so immediate yet so smooth that the Night Elf had to adjust to his change in surroundings. Then he had to adjust to Ysera's sudden disappearance. No, she had not disappeared. She stood but a few yards from where he floated, the mistress of the Emerald Dream now revealed in her full glory. A massive dragon with glittering green scales, she dwarfed Coriolstraz, the only other dragon that the druid had ever met. And she was not the only one. As his surroundings registered on him, the night elf discovered the two of them were far from alone. Three other gargantuan dragons stood near the center of the huge chamber. The red one surely had to be Alexstrasza, the one Krasis sought. She had a beauty and dignity akin to Isera, but more animation, more life. Next to her was a male nearly as large whose scales constantly shifted. From silver to blue to a combination of both, seemingly at whim. He had for one of his kind an almost bemused expression. In utter contrast to blue, the huge black beast that Malfurion eyed next sent shivers through even his spirit form. Here was Rolf power strength of the earth, but something more. Malfurion had to look away from the ebony giant, for each time he attempted to study him, a sense of unease touched the night elf. It was not simply because two of the same color had pursued the druid and his companion. No, it was something more, something dread. But if he thought to find more peace looking elsewhere, Malfurion had chosen the wrong direction, for now he stared at what so intrigued the giants. It was tiny, tiny enough to fit into his own palm. In the paw of the huge black, it was almost a speck. You, <clears throat> you see, rumbled its wielder, all is in readiness. It is but the moment that we wait for. And what? when will that moment come, cried Alexstrasza. Each passing day the demons ravage the lands, if not for the fact that their commanders have drawn more of their forces to take on the night elves, the other directions would all be would be all but lost by now. I understand your concern, but the dragon soul will be best applied when the heavens are in alignment. It must be that way. The red aspect gazed at the golden disk. Let us pray, then, that when it is utilized, it is all you say, Neltharion. Let us pray it is the deliverance of our world. The black only nodded. 
Valfurion, still awaiting his heir's signal to talk with Alex Straza, appeared closely at the simple-looking creation, his hopes rising. The dragons were acting. They had come up with a solution, a talisman of some sort that would rid Kalimdor of the Burning Legion. His curiosity got the better of him. He weakened his end of the link with Ysera so that, with all else going on, she might not notice what he, was att what he attempted. With his mind, he probed the shining disk, so insignificant in appearance, and yet apparently filled with such power that even dragons paid it homage. Truly, the demons would stand no chance against something like this. Not at all to his surprise, a protective spell surrounded the dragon's soul. The druids studied it, and in its elements he detected a peculiarity. Each of the great dragons had their own distinct auras, as all creatures did, and Malfurion sent some of those auras now. He felt the Seras, most known to him, plus those of Alex Straza and the Blue. The Black Dragons was also present, but not in the same manner. He seemed entwined around the rest, as if it held them at bay. His. It almost seemed to the druid that the spell had been designed to keep the others from sensing something within. More curious than ever, Malfurion used Cenarius' teachings to infiltrate the spell. He slipped through with far more ease than he had expected, perhaps because the disc's creator had never thought one such as he would even make an attempt. The druid pushed deeper, finally touching on the forces within. What he discovered within made him reel. He pulled out, stunned. Even in his present form, he shivered, unable to come to grips with what he had sensed. Malfurion looked again at the black dragon, astounded by what the Leviathan had wrought. The dragon's soul, that which was to save Kalimdor, held within it an evil as great as the Burning Legion itself. Oh, I think part of what makes these episodes hard, or makes the dragon part not as interesting to me, is it's so hard to come up with different ways. <gasps> To do all these dragon voices, it's hard in my throat. And I don't know if I, my son's had a cough lately. I don't know if I have allergies or if I've been combating, like, whatever he has. Or just all this extra reading. But, I mean, I'm sure you, as read, as listeners, you can hear, like, my voice. My voice is tired. Um, but in my profession, I speak a lot. Um, Not this past year, not as much as I have in the past, but uh, I, I have a lot of non-stop talking, so but nothing's quite as much as this reading. So this is a little bit of a strain. I mean, I'm not doing that much. I'm doing an hour and a half, two a day. Uh, um, yeah, I am curious. I don't know if the Dragon Soul plays a part. I kind of think it does. Part in destroying the will of eternity. I don't know, but we're halfway done with the book and halfway done with the trilogy. Trilogy now, another episode in the pipes five by five. Thank you all for listening to this episode of Lore of Warcraft, and I will see you on the next one.